Hello and welcome to another edition of Yakety Yak, where tonight we have the unusual privilege of being hosted in the home of our guest. Luca Belgiorno-Nettis is a Joint Managing Director of Transfield Holdings and a Director of Transfield Services. He sits on a wide range of boards and councils, including the Arts Advisory Committees for both the University of Technology Sydney and the University of Western Sydney. He's also the Chair of the Biennale of Sydney. In 2004, Luca founded the New Democracy Foundation, and in 2009, he was made a member of the Order of Australia for his services to arts and the community. To explore all of these things and more, our interviewer, as always, Peter Thompson. Luca, thank you so much for having us at your home, and welcome to Yakety Yak. I want to know, first of all, it's, it's a combination, a conversation where, which is a combination of, of uh, the personal and also the public, but you can't help but start with the personal when it comes to a family like yours. What was it like being born into a family with a father like yours? Uh, well, you never know what the difference is, of course, because you've only got one father. <laughs> and uh, he uh, was always full of energy and industrious and, and dragooning us sons into his various enterprises around the house, whether it was digging trenches and holes for trees or fixing fences or, or, or repairing electrical wires or plumbing or uh, it was anything. So he had a, he had a real passion for uh, working with his hands. He served in the Italian army during the war and then was taken prisoner of war in North Africa. So that gave him an opportunity to explore some of his, uh, some of the same sorts of things you talk C about correct. with, with these children. And I, and I mentioned it before, Peter, uh, I, I can't believe it when he, keeps on, he kept on saying that he enjoyed that experience as a prisoner of war. Uh, he would be one of the few. He, he, <laughs> and he, he kept on saying how, how uh, civil the English were. And here he was, you know, captured in, in North Africa and in Tobruk and transported to India to Lahore uh, and outside of Lahore and um, spent three and a half years in a prison of war camp and, and tried escaping a number of occasions and, uh, and with his fellow uh, uh, comrades and who were killed in the process. So he, he had those sort of experiences as well. That gave him an opportunity also for his enterprising spirit to come out. That's right, because he was, he was, he was building you know, rabbit coops and uh, grappa stills and uh, he was repairing watches, doing all these sort of things. And he was also somehow uh, uh, brought into making models and engineering models for the Lahore University. Uh, so he, and, he, and he also um, was very friendly with painters there, uh, artists, uh, uh, and he would be painting with them, and, and he just enjoyed that experience. Yeah. What was his family like? Uh, his, f his family was quite uh, tough. His, his father was quite tough. I met his father, my grandfather, briefly, who was not well uh, in his last years. His father was an engine driver. Uh, a railway engine driver in the south of Italy and so they were moving around quite a bit and his father was quite well versed at repairing uh, things with his his own workshop and he was uh, well regarded as a r rifle repairer uh, so he, he had that uh, element that he was uh, um, you know exp exposed to and my father would often say he would uh, he would always he would get hit on the head with the end of a hammer when he wasn't paying attention as he was helping. And did that do him any good? <laughs> yeah, 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 he kept him, kept him focused. <laughs> uh, how did he meet his mother, or your mother, uh, his wife? In, in, in Turin, in, uh, in, uh, uh, my father was won a scholarship to the military academy in Turin, and, um, and through that process, uh, rather, no, went to the war, after the war, came back to the to to the to Turin, and there met my mother after the war. So he was to move to Australia by himself initially, at least. Yeah, well, he was at that stage. He he had moved to Milano, had had um, was asked to uh, 
whether he was interested in going in on a contract to Australia to build Australia's first steel transmission line between Sydney and, and Tullawarra, the power station in Wollongong. And um, uh, so he went uh, there, but my mother, he was engaged to my mother, she couldn't come. So he, he went out first, they got married by proxy and then she came out. Uh, you <coughs> don't, don't think you'll get by with that married by proxy story without <laughs> further comment. What did married by proxy mean? It meant that she walked down the aisle with my father's brother and uh, uh, had a marriage certificate and that enabled her to uh, come out with, with appropriate visa papers. And she made the trip to Australia thereafter? Correct, yeah, on her own. So what did your father's view, uh, what was his view of what Australia would mean for his uh, he, he, fortune? He he, well, my mother was the one who basically recommended, he, he had an option to go to either Australia, he, the, gov the company that he was with, which was the biggest transmission line company in the world, out of Milano, Società Elettrica, Società Anonima Elettrica. And he had qualified as an engineer by He'd this He'd had two, two degrees in engineering, civil and electrical, with a postgraduate in electron electronics. So he was well qualified, and he was asked to either go, had an option to go to either Argentina or Australia, and my mother said, we've just come out of a fascist dictatorship, we're not going to Argentina. That was a good call. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> when in Australia, he and Carlo Salteri formed a business which was to ultimately become Transfield. My father would insist he founded the business. Oh yes, that was a matter of contention <laughs> some years later. <laughs> <laughs> You're moving too far ahead in the story. <laughs> um, when you grew up, you were born in 1954, uh, did the emerging Transfield, because it wasn't a big company to begin with. Of course, well, of course it wasn't. Did you live in the shadow of it? Well, not really. I, I can't remember uh, the sort of comments I'd get from my school colleagues was, why are you spending so much time during the winter break, you know, on, you know, overseas? So we would always have this extended winter holiday, which was the European summer, where we'd go back and visit. The, you know. So that was the sort of only reference point that we would get as to whether we were privileged or otherwise. Well, the only one that I recognised, because Transfield wasn't really, you know, when I left school in 71, it wasn't that well recognised. As I mentioned, it was only when, when, when we won the Sydney Harbour Tunnel in the, the late 80s that um, it became a household name, or at least became more, you know, more well known. So you're saying Transfield became really well known in the 80s, in particular with the Sydney Harbour Tunnel. But your father had established the art prize. It's true. Going back to 1959. Fair, 50, no, 61. 61. So early. Five years after the company was established in 56, so 61. This says a lot about him. Yeah, it does. He was, uh, he was always interested. You know, he actually thought he could have a career. Nevertheless, he's, I think he actually just played on that because he had three degrees in engineering. I mean, he wasn't going to become an artist overnight. Like, so he didn't need to. Um, or didn't need to in the sense that uh, he, he probably recognised it was more fruitful to be an engineer. But he always loved painting and, and sculpting and he did it right through his life till the, till the day he died. In his 90s he was still painting and sculpting. What did you see your destiny as growing up in a family like this? No idea. <laughs> I had no effing idea, Peter. <laughs> I mean, I was just a complete, I was a, a completely unfocused, uh, uh, scatterbrained young boy. And I, I continued <laughs> like that, probably still had. <laughs> Didn't the Jesuits bash some sense into you? No, not really. I, I, I sort of, I was never particularly um, radical as such, you know, I was not counter-establishment. And I quite liked... Uh, I, you know, I went to that school at St Aloysius from third class all the way through, so I had a good group of friends, and you know, I was just happy with the company. Um, yes, I mean they, they had a little bit of corporal punishment with the odd strap and you know the rest, but that was standard practice in those days. You know. So you were to choose architecture. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Uh, well, I I, I liked the, the, the notion of art and. Uh, uh, and 
the sort of the design aspects. Uh, in, in, you know, that was the way architecture was conceived in those days. It was more sort of design. Uh, in a way, I, I don't know that I'd conceive architecture those th these days in those terms, but um, uh, yeah, and what, it had what's the difference these days? Well, I would perceive it's, it's like Jan Gell. I use this reference regularly. Jan Gell's the consultant town planner here mm -hmm. in Sydney and Melbourne, for that matter. And his wife would say, he remind him, you know, buildings are about people. You know, they're not not just about design, not just about pretty pretty facades. So, was that a good choice for you? Yeah, I, well, I used this line where, um, <clears throat> you know, I've got three. My two brothers who do who are engineers and a father, and I use this line, which is relevant to also architects, but it's mostly to do with town planners. So engineers start off life knowing uh, uh, a lot about a small number of things, and end up getting to know everything about nothing, <laughs> right? Whereas town planners, on the contrary, know a little bit about a lot of things, and finish their careers with knowing nothing about everything <laughs> and, and, and architects are a bit like that you know we think we go know everything about it because we touch this we touch structure we touch design we touch psychology we touch you know so was this likely to be a good blend with transfield well because transfield had uh one of the subsidiary businesses was a company called subimo which was took the three names of the founders of that company Salteri, bill jordan and moratelli and Moratelli was the actual managing director of the company. He was the guy who started the company. He was a draftsman, but you know, a draftsman. It's not quite the, quite the right definition because uh, in Italy, the geometra is more than a draftsman. But he's not quite an architect. Anyway, he was a geometra. He started this company in um, the uh, uh, early '60s, and. Uh, built that company up for 30, 40 years to be a design and construct company, which is quite quite well known and quite uh, succe uh, successful because it made a profit for 30 years without exception. And they built a number of ex uh, characteristic buildings in North Sydney, was the, the Orange Building was one mm. of the feature buildings you know, at the time. They built the export house in the city, built uh, where Amex, uh, NRMA, I think it's NRMA now, corner of King and George Street, as a, as a contractor. But they did a lot of design work and there was, they had their own design um, engineers and architects in-house. So there was a sort of, and I ended up having my, my exposure, if you like, in my school holidays to that business and then eventually after I graduated, I. I went and worked in that company. So did you feel passionate about your work? Yeah, in a way, um, once you got beyond de de designing toilet blocks and, and, and uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah no, I, They're very important I, I, things. I, I, yeah, they are, and staircases, fire stairs and all the rest of it. Women know, always as, complain as, about as, the way they are as, designed, yeah, actually. <laughs> you know, architects have to do their sort of n normal trials, you know, uh, as, as most um, uh, professionals. Um, yeah, I'm, I kind of, I quite liked it. I mean, but I, I could, I, I don't know. I could see that uh, where the business was was in another area. It wasn't where in, in Subimo it was. So I ended up doing some property economics courses and and the like. So I ended up moving into the development side. So I, that was where uh, I, 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 I moved, if you like, away from architecting. Now, as is well known, a dozen years or so ago, uh, your father split with Carlo, and then subsequently there was a split in your own family. So rather than rake over the coals of those things, which I'm sure you don't want to do particularly, um, I'm interested in the impact it had on you. How could I explain it? Well, in a way, I suppose, just simplistically reduced the, the, the tensions from three to two from three brothers to two. So, you know, that made it a little easier. So <laughs> on the upside. <laughs> on the upside. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how else to talk about it. I mean, there are always going to be tensions in family businesses where you've got, you know, the siblings working, you know, comparing, you know, what's he doing? Is he earning more than me? And has he got more authority and all that sort of stuff, you know? 
Um, so how did it how did it otherwise impact? I mean, um, uh, I I don't know. I mean, I suppose yes, that notion of of uh, trying to broach conflicting uh, tensions was was something that we both felt the, the Guido and I who ended up staying together both felt we should never go through again so uh, we we ex accepted almost expressively expressively adopted a, a much more uh, collaborative framework well I'm interested in that and partly because did it have an influence or was that a trigger for you getting interested in the process of the wider democracy and how decisions were yeah. made and conflict was resolved? Yeah, I, Peter, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It could be. I, I don't know. You know, I mentioned that my father was quite authoritarian because he came from a military, you know, uh, experience uh, the, at the military academy. His father was quite authoritarian in his own right, so he had this streak of, uh, of you know, uh, command culture. But I, I just don't know. I mean, uh, I, I kind of, I'm quite uh, passive, you know, normally. Pe people sort of, you know, he would say, dragoon me in to do this, and I'd just go along with it, you know. So may maybe this is a reaction to it, I don't know. Well, what triggered your interest in the way politics operates? Well, it was a number of things. It was firstly because I could see that there, I'd been invited to these rubber chicken lunches, you know, where the campaign, funding exercises were happening, the parties were looking to business people like ourselves to make contributions and at one of these functions the hostess, who happened to be a hostess from one of the parties, you know, uh, we got talking and I said there must be a better way because they kept on talking about, you know, the economic uh, prowess that either party would have and I could see there was no real difference. I mean, they, in terms of economic management they were pretty much the same. So I, I said, you know, there must be a better way of doing things, and she basically fobbed me off. And I said, this, this is the way it's done, and there's no better way. So it just got me thinking, and then I started talking to some colleagues, Cathy Jones in particular, and we started talking around, well, you know, is there a better way? And we started investigating. There might be a better way. But it, we didn't know what we were, what we were going to find, and then we stumbled across um, Ian Marsh initially, and then, then, then Lynn Carson, prof both professors at Sydney University, and and things took took their stride. What to you is the nub of the problem? A adversarial politics. Well, adversarial politics, the nub of it is actually we are led to believe that elections, uh, that democracy rather, uh, is above all else free and fair elections. That is the guiding light on the hill. Most people would define democracy in those terms. Um, but it doesn't provide for collaboration. It may prov bring out the so-called breast and the brightest, but it doesn't bring about a collaborative environment. And then, then the thing is that democracy was never conceived like that. Democracy w was conceived in ancient Greece uh, as sortition, as random selection. Then, of course, the moment you say that, is the moment people say, well, random, so oh God, what do they know? Then you have to point to the fact that you've got the living legacy of the jury. And, and there you see that the jury operates, works uh, all the time quite well with randomly selected citizens who come up with sensible decisions on matters of life and death. And then I say, well, I haven't ever been a juror, but I've experienced a number of these panels of citizens that deliberate on matters, randomly selected citizens deliberating on matters, and found one thing, discovered one thing. Ordinary people, when given the opportunity to deliberate together, are in fact extraordinary. And you have to experience it. And if you, when you experience it, then you can believe the fact that you can, we can believe in ourselves. Then of course the next question is, and the easy, the easy question after that, is how do you translate that experience into government? Mm. And I'd say, well, look, there's a number of models. One which I particularly like from the US is a, is a professor from University of Vermont. He talks about a citizen senate. Randomly selected citizens in the senate, uh, rotated every two or three years, they deliberate on matters coming up from a lower house of normally elected people. Imagine what sort of dynamic that would make to our system. I bet you 
it would engender more trust, uh, more trust than the than than, than and participation and participation than the current uh, vote that we cherish so dearly. Well, it's all very well to have these views in an armchair way, but you've actually put your money where your mouth is and concerns in relation to this. Yeah, and we've got some supporters here too, you know, Jonathan O'Day. We've got state government and local government, our mayor from, uh, from Canada Bay, Alex Securis. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. So uh, fortunately, fortunately, we have people who, who are, uh, are coming along with this notion that you, you can find some sense in a group of so-called randoms. Well, in 2009, you ran or developed the idea of the Citizens Parliament, which you were part of. What did you learn from that experience? That's what I discovered. I discovered that ordinary people can be extraordinary. I mean, you've got to see some of this footage that we had of these people. What was extraordinary about it? That there was no acrimony, that people could talk about things and come to common ground without acrimony and have people talk to, to the subject, whatever, without, without actually standing up and saying, I'll be the spokesman. Just naturally people came up to be the spokesman. How many people came to the assembly? 150, randomly selected from every federal seat in, in the country. So how did it work? So we had 8,000 letters that went out, signed by Lower Joe O'Donoghue and Fred Cheney, inviting them to participate. From those 8,000, we got 3,500 responding, yes, we want to participate. From that 3,500, we selected the 150. And they met for how long? Four days in Canberra. And essentially... It was over, over the bushfire weekend, so we didn't get that black Saturday. We didn't get any coverage, no media coverage. It was as if, as if it sort of disappeared off the, off, the, off the planet. And the sorts of outcomes directly, what the Assembly agreed to, were, so, were process things on the whole, weren't they? Well, process... They, the, the basic question was, how, can you, how would you improve... How would you strengthen Australia's... Uh, system of government. That was the main question that was put to them and there was nothing that was given to them in terms of uh, prods from us or anyone else. We had a group of so-called experts, uh, the likes of, of, of um, Anthony Green, you know, the sort of sophologists and, and uh, uh, political scientists, they all presented a number of, of, of uh, uh, sitting, sitting and ex-MPs uh, and they talked about how the system. I mean, you know, a lot, a lot of people didn't even don't really even appreciate the difference between upper house and lower house. I mean, you know, there's a lot of basic education that needs to be done. But you know, the number one recommendation was number one recommendation is harmonise state laws. That was the number one recommendation I came up with. How sensible is that? Coag's been trying to work on that for as long as I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. What is different about a citizen's parliament is that the members of it aren't subject to the usual pressures. Correct. Correct. Uh, they don't have to campaign, they don't have to lobby, they don't have to seek re-election. They don't have to in, engage in the usual trade-offs. They don't have to use you know, trade-offs. <coughs> you know, and people will say, of course you'll get the odd you know, guy who goofs off. That's the way it is. Don't tell me, hey, we've got a few people goofing off in Parliament now. Have you noticed? In big ways. <laughs> It'd be hard not to notice, actually. <laughs> um, there is a difference, though, between people taking part in what is essentially an academic exercise and the reality of actually facing the pressures of sectional interests and the like in the real electorate. So what do you really learn from that process? and those, the fact that there are those obvious differences. Look, I, look you know, I, I don't really know how uh, normal people, I mean, of course, there's, you know, Alex Akaris does, it's quite a long paper, how he sort of envisages ordinary people, ordinary. Um, we, we talk about everyday Australians, we don't call them ordinary, everyday Australians or everyday people, how they could manage the fact that they uh, would have to leave their jobs for two or three years, you know, what, what's, what, what, what are their pecuniary interests in these things? I mean, they're quite complex, all of these things, to, f to settle down so in a way that 
they, they could be functioning. But I, I see those as important but detailed aspects. They, they, they could be resolved if there's a will there. The, the, I just feel that there is a um, there is a dynamic catalyst that could be introduced here by having citizens uh, in Parliament that are not elected in a normal way. During the last election campaign, Julia Gillard floated the idea of a citizens' parliament or a deliberative assembly to deal with climate change, and she was laughed at. Uh, it was quickly knocked on the head. I think that you know one has to see the context of that, and the context was I think she was she was seen to be sort of clamouring at, at you know grabbing straws and, and the sort of the, f the f sort of elements of the in the moments of the campaign and. I think people were on the one side. There was all this um, um, hype about, oh, we've got to. We all know that climate change is a big issue. We've just got to introduce the energy trading scheme. We don't need another citizens assembly, or any, we don't need another uh, consultative process to do it. So you had all of that hype that was poured onto it as well, and and it just all got confused. It was it was the worst time to even suggest something like that. In October last year, you announced the Democracy Plan B idea, which is what? Just what I said. Citizens randomly selected for Parliament. So this is not a new initiative, it's a restatement of the old, because the yeah. Parliament goes back to 2007, 2009. Uh, well, uh, well, I mean, I use that as a little bit of a sort of a teaser, you know, plan B. Plan A is what we got, it doesn't seem to be working that well, here's plan B. Try plan B. Try, try, let's try some innovative approaches to, to representative government. If there isn't a move towards some sort of plan B, what will the consequences be for a society like ours if uh, Parliament, and it is true that there's a great deal of public dissatisfaction with the way politics operates? I don't know, Peter, but I just see that in the demise of ideologies, with the left and the right fast disappearing, you know, we talked about your friend Ian Marsh. I love that terminology of hers, so of his. So, what is left for the politicians to do, with all due respect? Because they, they start off life well-meaning, absolutely, but there's a systemic <coughs> demand and imperative on them to basically win and retain office at virtually any cost. And in the demise of ideologies and, and, and left and right no longer there, what are their options? Their options tend to be either to manufacture their differences because, you know, hey, you've got to say something, I've got to say something different, right? Or to pander to populist agendas, or both. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, how are we going to determine what a tax outcome should be, or a tax, a better tax system is, without seriously collaborating, collaborating and working it through, not taking positions. Isn't politics fundamentally about conflict? Not necessarily. It's resolving it? isn't it a process of resolving differences. And yeah, but, but, but ends wh and why make why make it systemic? Why have silos? Why start off by having Systemic differences. I've got a I've got a campaign to be something, and you've got a campaign to be something different. Now, are we, we going to do it on char charisma? Well. So, what is the Transport Foundation about? It's about bringing together the interests of the public company and the private company holdings and services to fi find some common ground of common interests, and we've. We've worked through, thanks to Phil and others who are here from Transport Holdings, uh, worked through a <coughs> three focus areas. <coughs> One is um, at the arts interest that Holdings has had for some number of years, uh, a new initiative which is Aboriginal development programs, Indigenous development programs, and the third initiative which is sustainable resource management, which is basically trying to see how we can do things better with less resources. Those are quite different things. Correct, yeah. Well, we already had the arts, and then we thought, well, what else is worth supporting? And we all, and with Catherine Baldwin, who's the chair, uh, we all thought, well, these are two interests which 
um, particularly services have already started to do. So is the model that you will financially assist particular projects that are done by others? Correct, that's right. So we're not planning to do them ourselves. We're, uh, in respect of the Indigenous programs, we've already sponsored a number. We, you know, we agreed to sponsor a number of companies that companies, foundations, or, or rather, uh, uh, not for profits that are in that space. And why did you go that way rather than actually handling things more directly yourself? Well, we don't need to. I mean, I think like like other foundations. Uh, I mean, that's not, you know, that have have been a sort of find the, the worth, the merit worthy organisations that are doing it already. There's plenty out there. Well, there's a long history, of course, of your support <coughs> for art. Yeah, and there's organisations that are doing that sort of thing, yeah. Like the Biennale and like the uh, Sculpture by the Sea and <coughs> then, of course, going back yes. to the Art Prize itself. What about uh, on the Indigenous front? What sort of projects are you interested in supporting? Well, one that's just a recent one is the uh, Many Rivers organisation, which is a, a microfinance uh, initiative. So that that's one. Uh, so it's trying to, f you know, it's not just sort of handouts. It's it's got the um, that that enterprise element to it. Um, so we think that that's worthwhile. And on the sustainability front, what are you looking at? We're looking at at. For long discussion about how we might find things, and I think Peter Good, who's the managing director of Transfer Services, um, he was particularly interested in in funding um, uh, young researchers. This actually came about with a long study with uh, a number of our organisa uh, uh, colleagues, David Ivorak, and so we're looking at funding postdoctoral research programs. Transfield Services still is one step removed, at least, from the whole construction process. They're not directly involved in Correct, construction. Correct, engineering days. maintenance. On the, on the issue of sustainability, <coughs> I know you've got a particular passion about cities and sustainability. <coughs> where do you see inspiration or where do you see hope in terms of cities being designed in a better, more sustainable no, I, way? I, I see hope. I, I, I'm, 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 Ian, Ian Walker here and I, we've been working uh, liaising with um, Chris Johnson from the Urban Task Force, the ex-government architect. And you might have seen just recently in last last week's paper was um, talking about how to re revitalise Parramatta Road. <coughs> That's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. I mean, we've got something like we have to... I like, I like you saying revitalise. Yeah. <laughs> revitalise. <laughs> you know, the challenge is we've got something like 500,000... Uh, new uh, 500,000 people that will be coming into Sydney in the next 30, 40 years, 30 to 50 years. Where are they going to be? You, you, you can't stop them that readily. Uh, yes, you can have decentralisation programs, try and get them to go to Wollongong or Newcastle or, you know, or Wodonga or, you know, wherever else. But there's going to be pressure on Sydney. So you've got to house them somewhere. It's quite plain that we have a very inefficient urban model. I know this is the last place you could talk about this because we've got this house, big house here with <laughs> grounds and the rest of it. We've got to have more apartment blocks. There's no alternative. And they've got to be close to the city. So where we're working with Chris is he's saying most of the people are against having apartment blocks next to their houses. It's a political problem. How do you how does one uh, make this come about when you've got general opposition happening? Well, there has to be a process of, of collaboration with the local communities where the local communities might see there are trade-offs. There could be trade-offs by just buying their properties at, at some inflated v values. Alternative them recognising that actually having a, an apartment block near them with all the facilities it can give in terms of revitalising the area with you know amenities and shops and the rest of it would be a positive rather than a negative. So, but it's a question of having a dialogue, not just sort of saying we're going to do this here, and then you get all of this you know, reaction, negative reaction from the locals. Thinking about the future, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? <laughs> God, that's a big question, but I, I'm uh, 
I'm happy with with the direction of new democracy. I'm I'm very happy with with uh, my kids and my family where they are at the moment. Um, uh, it'd be good to make a contribution to 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 improving you know civil civil society, and I think w we can do that. Luca, thanks very much for coming Thank on. Thank you, Peter. <laughs>